All right, Malky Murray, we're back, New York Talk. I got a hot mic here in New York City, so don't mind any noise you might hear in the background. Anyway, this history lesson is going to be about baseball. Now, you got to be really careful when you talk about baseball in New York City, because to most Americans, baseball's not just their sport, it's their religion. <laughs> so no doubt we're going to take off a lot of people in this episode. And while we're at it, I want you to try and pick up all the baseball puns that we're going to put into this. There's going to be a number at the end. See who's closest to it. All right. Stand by. Okay, despite what you hear from various people, even in baseball, baseball was not invented by General Abner Doubleday in 1839. No, that's a complete fabrication. It's a fraud. It's a lie. So at the time, don't forget, it wasn't until World War I where England decided in America we needed each other to fight the, the horrors of Europe. And up until that point, English were taking shots at us any, any chance they get. And when they saw American pride to start to swell around this sport we invented, they had to jump in and, and kick us and, and, and <laughs> put their mark on us again. So the English concocted this story that baseball was not invented in America. It was invented in England. And it was brought over to America by English expatriates. Okay, they wouldn't even call them immigrants. They were calling them expatriates. That showed these American rubes this this beautiful sport they have. And the Americans are trying to claim it as their own. So to combat this story, America had a fire back with a story of their own that they created, they made up. So the sports writers got together under baseball and they said, Look, let's let's make up the story attached to a war hero. Baseball was invented in America. And a town that has no immigrant influences, a town that has no outside industries to, to influence it. It's purely American, invented by a war hero. His name was General Abner Doubleday. General Abner Doubleday probably never told a lie in his entire life. And then 15 years after he died, they attach his name to the story. One. If Abner Doubleday invented baseball, it would have to been done during his tenure as a cadet West Point Military Academy. Would have never happened. Two, Abner Doubleday was a prolific writer. He wrote a million books in his lifetime, and not once does he mention baseball. So there's that. New York City is where baseball was invented. However, it was influenced by just the fact that it's been around forever. It evolved from a yard game into a professional sport through America, New York City. First of all, batted baseball games have been going on since man's been walking on two legs. Man has picked up a stick and hit a rock or a ball into a field and ran around bases to play and have fun. It wasn't really considered a sport. It was just something you did. Different cultures, I mean, it goes back to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Persians, the ancient Romans, the ancient, uh, who knows, Babylonians, even maybe the Sumerians played a version of this game called a baseball game. But it was the English who finally would kind of semi-formalize it into a game that they would call Rounders. Rounders was a game that was invented in a yard that the kids would play by hitting a ball and running around a circle uh, to these different bases. There could be anywhere to three to five bases on the field. These bases could be anything, you know, a wheelbarrow on the corner, a root sticking out of the ground, a tree stump, maybe somebody's mailbox, and then you weren't safe until you were off the field somewhere down the block or across the street. So one guy stood there against the barn with a bat and he'd hit a ball, and they'd run to the bases, and the guys in the field would chase this ball down, they'd pick it up, they'd turn around, and they'd throw it at the guy trying to run. You know, he was on the base, he was safe. And you go from base to base, usually in a circle, until you were off the field. And, you know, like I said, no uniformity. There was no exact distance between bases. There was no amount of bases. It was whatever was in the yard. And it was just a yard game. It's called Rounders. So it comes to America. America is this new country. You know, the next generation or so starts to play it. And they start to break away from England. We have a war of independence. Come a free and independent nation, and now, you know, we're looking for some pastimes, and this game is an English game, so we don't want that. We're going to call it Town Ball. It's one of the first things they do. The Americans turn into a game called Town Ball. And what's different about Town Ball? Well, we're going to do different from the British. What we're going to do now is we're going to run the opposite direction. We're going to go counterclockwise. But it's not until about 1837. This is when a New York attorney named William Wheaton, who's a fireman, volunteer fireman for the Gotham, firehouse which has a 
team called the Gotham Baseball Team. Now, why do they have a baseball team and nobody else? Well, this is why. By the 1830s, now America has realized that England, although they were a threat, they're not so much of a threat anymore. Um, we're coming out of our little wooden shanties and we're starting to realize it's better that we exercise. It's, it's you know, get some fresh air in our lungs, like the famous poet Walt Whitman used to say. So they want to come up with a sport that they can play, a team sport. Cricket's one of them, but let's face it, cricket's English, so we're not going to identify with that. And look at this game that these kids are playing called Town Ball. And it's a baseball game. Like, just like this baseball game's going all over America. Different rules, different, you know, nothing's really organized into one uniform thing. And yes, this game amongst the firemen in his and firehouse, and they play it amongst each other. Any other fire department was a rival. All right, now, New York City in the early 1800s is, is kind of a nightmare. It's starting to get really overpopulated. Everything is made out of wood. And wood burns as you know so it's really important to have firemen but in america we can only have volunteer firefighters in europe it's a little bit different the fire insurance companies pay professional firefighters in america we haven't really got that sophisticated yet so the firefighters over here for the most part are volunteers you got a city where everything's made out of wood the only way to heat your homes is by fire okay this is you know no modern heating there's no plumbing we don't we're not getting fresh water from upstate in the aqueducts People are starting to live on top of each other. You got problems with, uh, you know, sanitary conditions. You got problems with, you know, bad food, bad water, uh, diseases, gangs. It's very violent. And being a firefighter was kind of a big deal back then because fires were breaking out every day somewhere in the city. Everything's made out of wood. It's before the concrete foundations and the, you know, steel structures that you see there today. Back then, they were little wooden shanties. The, the highest they can go is five stories. That's because there's no water pressure in the upper floors. The Romans figured this out long before we did. That's why ancient Rome never had anything that was livable above five stories. But Rome is an empire. They can just spread out. We're an island. You know, at a certain point, we've got to start going up. And that's kind of what happened. Buildings start to appear in places you never thought you see buildings, like in between buildings or behind buildings or even on top of buildings people start to forsake the five-story law and live on the sixth, the seventh, even as high as the ninth floor, with no water pressure in the upper floors. They didn't care. They'd rather deal with that inconvenience than have to commute to an island every day. And then one day the unthinkable happened. The second most tragic fire in the history of America happened right here in New York City. A fire that in 1835 burned for like four of the coldest days in December. A billion dollars worth of damage, and at this point, 19 of the 20 fire insurance companies went out of business. And that's when we decided to make some of the rules. And um, of those rules would be, now you have to pay firefighters. They have to be paid professionals. But that took a while. And along the way, there were some growing pains in that. Along the way... The only people they would pay, the only volunteer firefighters they would pay would be the first ones to show up at a fire. Which meant you had to get to the fire first to get paid. Which meant they would send their rookie out. Everybody had a rookie. It was probably the toughest guy in the firehouse. When that bell rang to sound the alarm for a fire, the rookie had to run right to the fire, right to the nearest fire plug and guard it with his life. And he often took a bat with him. Okay, so here come the bats rest of the fire department, their job was to go to the firehouse and get the horses ready, load the carriage, get the gear, and head to that fire as fast as you can, because that rookie's got to protect that, that hydrant against the other rookies that are coming there to secure that hydrant. And then whoever's fire department came first, it, you know, got to the plug first, put their hose on it, would get the money for the fire. So it wasn't too uncommon where people were watching their entire businesses and homes go up in flames and the fire department's out there in the street fist fighting to see who would have the right or the money to get the fire out and so those who would eventually change but around the same time here comes baseball baseball was played amongst the volunteer firefighting companies the first would be the gotham baseball club the gotham baseball club came from the gotham fire department the gotham club was made up of guys who called themselves Native Americans. Not what we call Native Americans today. 
Native Americans back in those days meant that you were a son or a grandson of a patroon or an original European settler who came here in the 1600s. So they called themselves Native Americans. They were all white, either Dutch or English ancestry. The Gotham Club is the one that came up with the whole baseball idea. The Gotham Club was big enough, we only had to play the game amongst themselves. And they did it mostly to just blow off steam. You'd work a hard day, whatever your job was, they were all, you know, captains of their industry, attorneys, doctors, you know, uh, bankers, what have you. And then they would go to the firehouse and wait around for a fire. And to pass time, they would exercise. They got tired of lifting weights or whatever. So they wanted to come up with a game that they can identify with. And they didn't want the game of cricket for two reasons. One, it's an English game, and they want nothing to do with England. Two, you ever watch a cricket game? They're pretty long. I mean, some of those cricket games take days, because most of the cricket games, the entire side gets to come to bat every inning. And it can go on and on and on. These guys just wanted to get out there, hit a ball, run around, and get some exercise and fresh air and drink. Another guy in the Gotham Club, a younger guy named Alexander Cartwright, steps up. He's a banker. Numbers guy. He's got these numbers jumping around his head. And he wants to take baseball in another direction. Yeah, it's fine. It's exercise. It's fun. We get to socialize with each other. But he sees it something bigger. He identifies with it as, as this could be something, you know, that we can all play in, in the American identity. Anytime that you see a baseball field or stand on a baseball field, anywhere that baseball field, you're standing on a piece of New York City real estate. You stand in the batter's box on either side, you're standing on the corner of 23rd Street and Madison Avenue, New York City. That's where the rules of this game that we played today were drawn up first by Alexander Cartwright and his Knickerbocker organization. Now, Alexander Cartwright was a member of the Gotham Baseball Club, which played at Sunfish Park, which is over on the east side, uh, on the river, away from everybody and everything. And they made it exclusive to them. They didn't really share it with the outside world. The Gotham Club was kind of unique unto themselves, Native Americans. And Cartwright saw something different. Well, those guys were playing to exercise and drink beer and have fun. He saw a vision of baseball as an American identity. He got it. He said, this is it. Now, he had to break away from the Gotham Club to start his own. And he gathered up a bunch of guys as well to form the Knickerbocker Organization. The Knickerbocker Organization wasn't that exclusive. They had this vision to take baseball to where it should be. Everybody is involved. So they moved from Sunfish Park. They found a spot boldly in Midtown Manhattan. 23rd Street, Madison Avenue, Madison Square Park. The Madison Square Park today is Caddy Corner to where it used to be. What's sitting there today is the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building. But before that, it was Madison Square Gardens 1, 2, and P.T. Barnum's Hippodrome. We had the circuses. And it was a lot of fun. We're going to talk about P.T. Barnum in the future. New York talk. Anyway, back to baseball. That's where Cartwright and the Knickerbockers drew up their rules. Corner of 23rd Street, Madison Avenue. At the time, you looked down the third baseline, that was Madison Avenue. That was the site of the breweries in New York City. And who, who hangs around breweries but sports writers? On the other side, 23rd Street, was the high-end shops and some saloons. Who goes there? It's the high-end shops. The ladies. What do the ladies do? Ladies talk. This is before the internet. This is before TV and radio. It was only newspapers and gossip. So, right in the middle of 23rd Street and Madison Avenue is this park where everybody comes out to play, including lots of kids playing this game called Town Ball. That's why Alexander Cartwright and his Knickerbockers go out there, and I don't know about how long it took, but they went out and measured out a baseball field, as we know it today. No longer are we running around in circles. He makes it a diamond. Here's where he had the genius to draw up the baseball field. He, the numbers guy he was had these numbers jumping around his head. Of course, his favorite was the number nine. So anyway, he could put the number nine into baseball. It fits in kind of nicely. He's got uh, nine innings per game. He's got nine fielders on the field. He's got three outs per inning, but three strikes per out. Three times three is nine. He also had nine balls, but that got changed later on. It's four balls today, and you get a water to base. Uh, even the baseball itself is nine inches in circumference. So, like I said, any way he could put the magic number nine into baseball, it, it kind of fits in nicely. Sports writers caught on to it. First, they were calling it the New York game. They didn't really call it baseball back then because baseball covered all the batting ball games. So they called it the New York game when it first started. Now, 
baseball starts to get really popular. Even guys from as far away as Brooklyn are catching on. And Brooklyn is a separate city at this point, and there's no Brooklyn Bridge yet. These guys have to actually take a ferry to come over here. But they're into it, too. In fact, the Brooklyn Club, the Excelsior Club, is the one to invent the baseball cap that we have today. That's probably the most iconic piece of Americana, is the baseball cap. In fact, I got my jam right here. It's not only used in baseball by baseball fans, it's used in the military. Right? This is my old ship. It was this Manitowoc, LST 1180. Go Navy. That's right. <laughs> it's used by our first responders and our military, our, our truck drivers, advertising. That's great. You know, whatever you're delivering, you have your truck driver wear their hat and wherever he goes to have his lunch or whatever, he's advertising. Problem is, when you have adults playing a children's game, the adults play with much more power. So they were breaking a lot of windows, which the saloon and the shopkeepers got together and decided to outlaw baseball in Manhattan altogether. So very early on, baseball automatically became an outlaw sport. And of course, that infuriated a lot of people, including the Gotham Baseball Club. They weren't happy with this at all. They had a nice little thing to themselves that they kept away from everybody, but Cartwright, you know, according to them, ruined a good thing. But <laughs> today we know better. He had, he had a pretty good vision. Cartwright had the vision that this would be our identity. This is the American game sports writers agreed they just had to find another venue because right now the only people playing baseball in New York City and in Brooklyn are outlaws Alexander Cartwright is going through hell his bank gets burnt in the great fire of 1845 he has no job he's a volunteer firefighter so that's got to weigh heavily on him people in the Gotham Baseball Club hate him he made baseball an outlaw sport he can't play it anymore in Manhattan officially so he's working odd jobs, definitely family members. He's kind of too old to start all over again doing something else. But he never gives up his love for the game. The New York game, or as we know today, baseball. So he moves on, and how do we play it? we got to find another venue. And so he gets help from John Cox Stevens of the famous Stevens family. And they own pretty much most of Hoboken, New Jersey. Hoboken is just across the Hudson River on the west side of Midtown Manhattan. And we're going to talk more about the Stevens family in future uh, New York talks, but we're going to get back to baseball. Now, John Cox Stevens is the one who brought cricket to America. In fact, part of his estate over there in Hoboken, he has Elijah Fields, which was an old cricket pitch or cricket field. John Stevens was more than happy to have Alexander Cartwright come here with his knickerbockers and present this new American game that we all hope was going to be a sport. Alexander Cartwright is going to take his knickerbockers, he's going to split them up, he's going to form another team called the New York Nines, I mean, why not, it's his favorite number, and they're going to play each other in this exhibition to show the world what this new American sport is. He found an identity through baseball, and now he's going to sell it. So, he's got a lot of work to do. He's promoting his rear end off. Cartwright is telling everybody who is anybody, and this is before telephones and radio and TV and... You know, one thing he's got going for him is John Stevens. Another thing is that Hoboken is loaded with breweries. Some of the first breweries in America were over in Hoboken. So there's lots of literati all around. The New York literati is coming out. Anybody who is anybody wants to see what this new American game is. So the date rolls around. Alexander Cartwright stepped off the ferry in Hoboken, New Jersey, with four of his teammates show up to support him. Disaster. He's got to show the whole world his life's work, his opus, his genius of this New York game. And four guys show up on a sport he needs at least 18. So now he's humiliated. He's complete disaster. He's standing there. He's trying to figure out what to do. But he never gives up. And amongst the crowd members, he notices some familiar faces. Of them are his rivals. Gotham Baseball Club is there. All the firehouses have their teams there. Guys from Brooklyn are there. He's even got gangs out there with their bats. They want to play too. And he looks at this mob and he sees what people who have vision only see. He, he sees his vision. He sees that this is America. This is what he wants the sport to be. Something where everybody can play. And you can put down your differences and, and get on with this beautiful game. And so he, he calls them over. I don't know exactly what he says, but he manages to split the teams up to where the Gotham Club 
they're going to play on the New York 9 side. He takes his couple of knickerbockers over here, and he splits up the rest of the firehouses and gangs and guys from Brooklyn clubs on, on the different sides. And he serves as the first official umpire of this game. And he knows it's going to be trouble. This Gotham club is tough. They've been playing for at least 10 years now. Different rules, but they still know how to hit, and they still know how to pitch. And so... He decides, rather than call balls or strikes and get too involved in that, he's going to present this game more of a gentleman game. He's got a bunch of ruffians over there on each side, so he's got to he's got to kind of show you know a little bit of authority, I guess. So he just starts leveling out fines for spitting or cursing or fighting or whatever. And of course, the Knickerbockers get completely blown out, and by the fourth inning, it's twenty-three to one. Most of the people are walking away. Um, if we didn't know it then, we learned it now that although it's the hitters that bring people to the baseball games, baseball is all about pitching. And this is probably why starting pitchers are the highest paid professional athletes in all professional sports. It's about the pitching. And this game is everything that America is, really. He, he sees the identity, the game goes off, it's a little bit of a bump, it doesn't go the full nine innings, he gets completely blown out, but he never gave up. It's official, it's documented, it's the first official game. A game that at the time is still called the New York game. By most sports writers. Uh, it's a baseball game. Later on they would put it all together and just call it baseball. When you study baseball, all the box scores are going to come up, but they weren't playing under the Knickerbocker rules, which is close we have to the rules of the game today. Who knows what kind of rules they were playing by. The Gotham Club, they've been playing for 10 years, but mostly they were just hitting and running and drinking and, you know, nobody really, nothing was really organized. But this was the first official game. They even made a plaque to put out there on Elijah Fields to commemorate the first game. But somebody stole it. And they didn't bother replacing it because they figured someone would just steal it again. But that's where it all started. That was the first day, Friday, June 19th in 1846. And that's baseball. All right, now it's 1849. So Alexander Cartwright decides he's going to go out and try his luck at the California Gold Rush. Ironically, so does his arch rival, William Wheaton. And just like the two guys who looked at the same thing, had two different visions of it. Now, Cartwright was going to take the land route. He's going to take a stagecoach over the Appalachian Mountains, across the Mississippi River, and out to San Francisco. Wheaton gets on a ship, and he sails around. That was before the Panama Canal was open. He sails around the entire continent of South America. He's got all the way around there to get to San Francisco. So the story goes, along the way, Alexander Cartwright is spreading baseball around, kind of like Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> every saloon, every bar, every town he stops in, he gets out and he plays baseball with the stagecoach trail he's on. Um, which is tr partly true. He, he does do this, and he's got to stop every day. But once you get over the Appalachian Mountains, and, and then when you get across the Mississippi River, America's pretty much, there's nothing out there. It's, it's vast. You go probably days and days without seeing anybody. Supposedly, Lewis and Clark played baseball in their expedition. They learned it from Cartwright or somebody from Cartwright. Who knows? But anyway, Cartwright gets to San Francisco. He finds that the gold rush kind of stinks. It's not really panning out. Nobody around is really making a lot of money. So I guess he wires back home for correspondence, and, and back in New York they're telling him that the Chinese are interested in baseball, and they want somebody out there to, to show them, because the Chinese want to show the rest of the world baseball. So now he's not going to turn this offer down. He's all excited. Cartwright jumps on the next boat to China. The problem is when Cartwright gets to Hawaii, he gets off the boat, and he never gets back on. He stays in Hawaii because... He was seasick every day. He hated it. And this is embarrassing because a guy like Cartwright, who was the descendant of whalers from New England, and his family spent years at sea hunting whales so they can get oil to burn the gas lights. That's what they used for energy back in those days. And he, that's what his whole family did, except for him. And he never was on a boat until he got to San Francisco. And so he was seasick every day. He was embarrassed. He hated it. He's never going to get on a boat again, ever. So he stays in Hawaii, and he sends for his family. So while he's in Hawaii, now Cartwright falls back on his business acumen. And he, he sets up some local businesses, a volunteer firefighting station. He gets involved with baseball there locally, of course. Builds a baseball field somewhere. 
and he gets involved with some local Hawaiian politics. The, the Hawaiians love him. This is before Hawaii was a state, don't forget. This is just an American territory. And Cartwright gets there, and he gets involved in their number one export, canning pineapples. And he makes them a fortune. And they make Cartwright an honorary chief. Uh, he had the original ball that they played in Hoboken that day. He kept that as a, as a family memento. He handed it to his son. And I guess his son never really secured it in anything like a glass case or something because his son, Cartwright's grandson, six-year-old kid, saw the baseball one day and got curious and he cut it open. The scene was inside of it. So this priceless family heirloom that's, that's been in their family forever is now ruined <laughs> because of the curiosity of a, of a six-year-old kid. Now, Wheaton is in San Francisco, and like Cartwright, he has no luck. I'm not sure if Wheaton and Cartwright ever connect again, but Wheaton, you know, he gets involved in other things, too, local politics. He, he wins elections in, in some local offices. He gets involved in the cable companies that, you know, pull those trolleys around. So he does pretty good, too. Both guys that, you know, two of the founders, that they lived out a pretty good life. Back in New York, baseball's taken off like crazy because of the sports writers, and, and particularly a sports writer named Henry Chadwick. It's a major contributor to baseball because Henry Chadwick invented the baseball box scores. This is what I think pushed baseball the furthest, the fastest, was the invention of the box scores from Henry Chadwick because this is so important. There's a lot of things going on in New York City, okay? One thing we didn't mention was illiteracy. There's a big problem in America is that not everybody can read. A lot of people can't. So they don't buy newspapers. Newspapers have to get really creative to sell their stories. They might not know how to read or write, but what they sure as heck know how to do is add and subtract and multiply. They know basic math. Now, people coming from all over the world to America for all kinds of freedoms, but they're coming to New York to make money. And you're not going to make any money if you don't know basic math. Everybody knew math. Everybody knew numbers. And that's what Chadwick kind of envisioned. Because he took baseball and he invented the box scores. And this is what's important, because most sports... You score or you don't. Baseball is loaded with statistics. He invented the batting average and the ERA for the pitchers. Baseball's full of hits and runs and doubles and singles and triples and home runs. He's got. They're still inventing statistics for baseball today. But that was enough to make a complete box score and to profile the players and the games. It got to the point where 25% of the daily newspaper was baseball box scores. And that was selling papers. So, thanks to Henry Chadwick, now newspapers are starting to sell. And of course, the news media is starting to spread baseball around. Because if they could sell papers in New York, they can sell them anywhere. And it gets to the point where in 1856, the sports newspapers in New York City are already calling baseball America's game. Yet it's played in only two cities. Manhattan and Brooklyn. That's right, Brooklyn was a separate city at the time. Well, how does baseball spread around the country? We got our army to thank for that. It was very popular amongst the Union soldiers, and now the story of Abner Doubleday kind of plays in a little bit. They say he let his troops play baseball in between battles to blow off some steam, but so did every other general. It was just a common thing that the soldiers did play baseball. They took baseball to war with them. How it spread around the world is even more interesting because around the same time in the 1860s, the country of Cuba was sending its more enlightened students to American universities like Columbia up here in New York City. And they wanted to learn all about, you know, what we learned about here. And they saw this game, baseball, as an outlaw sport or a rebel sport, and they loved it. The Cubans was sick and tired of the playing the sports that their oppressive Spanish regime was putting on them. So they, they took baseball home to Cuba with them, and naturally the Cuban government outlawed baseball there. So they were all too happy to keep playing it anyway. They learned to play it at night. We're going to fast forward to 1907. President Theodore Roosevelt is going to show the world the great American naval prowess by unleashing 16 battleships. He paints them all white, and it's nicknamed the Great White Fleet. He knew it was a former secretary of the Navy. But the ancient Babylonians said that those who control the seas control the world. Now, even though America is not considered a world power or even a superpower at the point, he's going to make sure that the rest of the world knows that we're going to back up our allies and we're going to enforce our treaties. 
So he gets these ships to sail around the world. This is right before the Panama Canal opens, so they kind of have to sail around the long way. What's this got to do with baseball? Well, this is how baseball spreads around the world. Now, the irony is that President Theodore Roosevelt did not like baseball. In fact, he kind of hated it. He saw it as a spin-off of an English game. He didn't really see it as a manly sport, although it is. Roosevelt was more of a football guy, and we're going to talk more about Roosevelt and football in future history lessons here at New York Talk. But although Roosevelt hated baseball, uh, his sailors and his marines didn't. They loved it. And everywhere and every port that those ships stopped in, the marines and the sailors cut off on the beach, and they took with them the baseball game that they would show the natives of these countries. And the country of Japan fell madly in love with baseball, and they're responsible for spreading it out most of Asia. It became so popular in Japan that it became Japan's uh, second favorite sport next to judo. Ball takes a lot of pride in America. America takes a lot of pride in baseball. It's our sport. It was a game that was invented in New York City by our first responders. It was spread out through the rest of America by way of our army and spread out around the world through our sailors and marines. All right, that's going to do it for another New York Talk. I'm your host, Malachi Murray, encouraging you all to come back till next time. Smash that like button. Spread the love. And for the love of whatever you call holy, read, read, read. And get back to us, too, you know. I believe only iron can sharpen iron. So until next time, take care.